Okay, guys, this is Industrialization, Immigration, and Urbanization, Day 5. And if you remember, uh, we ended up with the Knights of Labor ending uh, because of the Haymarket Square riot and all of their leadership being uh, uh, castigized and four of them uh, executed and then four others imprisoned for instigating a riot that resulted in those seven so who's going to step up? This fellow, Samuel Gompers, you remember from your crash course, uh, he is going to be the founder of the American Federation of Labor. And this is a union that is still in existence today, and it is going to be a union of skilled labor. So the AFL, the American Federation of Labor, is the first modern-day union. It's a craft union only skilled workers. This is a huge umbrella. So teachers are members of this union, uh, Screen Actors Guild, uh, um, electricians, plumbers, people with skills. So you have these, these auxiliary unions all under this big umbrella under the American Federation of Labor. It is still around today and is the union we were talking about strikes before, and of course the first one was the railroad strike of 1877. And then the next really big strike that we're going to talk about is the Pullman strike, which again is related to the railroads. Pullman cars, all the cars except for the locomotive. So they were luxury passenger cars, your freight cars, and so forth. And of course remember with all the, the, the trains all over the, the country, this was a huge huge, huge business. And the workers are very unhappy with their pay and long hours, and they are going to go on strike and pretty much in solidarity with the other uh, railroad workers, shut down the nation. This is an example of how luxurious some of these cars were. They had reclining seats, they had uh, bar cars, smoking cars, and of course dining cars with um, uh, beautiful dining room and, and waiters that um, served very, very beautifully cooked. So Eugene Debs, and this is a name that you need to remember because we're going to be seeing a lot of Eugene Debs. He was in charge of the American Railway Union. And two-thirds of all railroad workers walked off the job, over 10,000 people. Now this shuts down the nation. So because it shuts down the nation, it hurts people. You know, people aren't getting food, people, uh, businesses aren't getting supplies, so workers don't have, have work. So because of this, Grover Cleveland issues the very first federal injunction. Now, an injunction can be issued forcing people to go back to work until a settlement can be reached. And so an injunction for the common good, they have to go back to work. There's been other examples of this. The air traffic controllers, when they went on strike, uh, Ronald Reagan issued an injunction um, in uh, if, if police officers or so forth. Anyway, it, if it hurts the common good, federal officials can issue an injunction to tell workers to go back to work. Debs refused. He refuses this federal order, and he is thrown into prison. Now, this isn't the first time Debs is going to be thrown into prison, so remember that name, Eugene Debs. The strike again ends in violence. Seven workers are killed, and the strike is broken. So this is Eugene Debs. He's a very handsome young man. He looks like Skeletor when he gets older, but he is going to be around for quite some time, run for president several times. The next strike we're going to talk about is the Homestead Steel Strike of 1892. Those of you who watched Men Who Built America, this is the strike where uh, Carnegie's Steel Company is run by a man named Frick. He hires the Pinkertons, and again, more violence. Nine workers are will. But Frick's assassin, okay, he's a, a, you remember from Men Who Built America, he comes to kill Frick and shoots, hits him in the ear, penetrates his neck. Frick is shot twice, and he still jumps up, grabs Berkman's arm, and even though he's wounded, uh, he tackles his assistant. And uh, basically, basically, Berkman is the one who's going to end up in jail, and Frick lives on. 
So this is uh, showing the scene from the movie as Berkman comes in to shoot Frick for uh, for pinging, bringing in those Pinkertons and all those workers being killed. All right, this is just more of the account. Uh, Frick gets stabbed four times in the leg. Frick is back at work in a week. Berkman is charged, found guilty of attempted murder. So, I mean... He's, he goes to prison for 22 years, and 2,500 men ultimately lose their, their jobs, and most of the workers who stayed still lost most of their wages. This just shows all the other strikes that are occurring and the violence. Right down here uh, in Louisiana, close to Baton Rouge, there's a sugarcane strike, and the state militia will end up killing 30 people, mostly African Americans. Uh, we've got the Pullman strike we just talked about, the Homestead uh, strike, the Anthracite's coal strike, where um, 140,000 miners strike. And this is one that, that uh, Theodore Roosevelt is going to step in, and he is going to force the owners to make some concessions to the miners. Uh, 40 hungry strikers are killed in the textile strike here, the Ludlow Massacre we talked about, 20 people end up dead, two women and 11 children. Uh, then we have a silver miner strike way up here in Montana, and a thousand workers are jailed. So you can see these, this, these strikes happen across the country and they're all marked by violence. Here's a little timeline of these strikes. So, in retaliation against the uh, uh, unions, there were many political cartoons that should depict the union leaders as uh, kind of taking money from their workers and not really doing anything for them. And this is showing kind of the decadence of uh, Terence Powderly having a nice cocktail here, living in the lap of luxury, and in the background, his workers are making next to nothing. Hey, let's talk about the inventors during this time. You remember I told you that there were more inventions during this time period than at any other time in history. And exciting inventions that are going to lead to things in the future. These are some inventions between 1860 and 1900. Um, the typewriter, phonograph light bulb, the zipper, um, radios, subways, x-rays. So all of these um, patents, over 500,000 patents, were issued between 1800 and 19. Isaac Singer revolutionized the commercial sewing machine. Now, Elias Howe had invented a sewing machine, but Isaac Singer made every woman could make their own clothes quickly. So in 1851, this was the first commercial sewing machine. You can see they had the uh, pedal at the bottom, and then ultimately they'll have a uh, motor, and it really hasn't changed much. This is a lovely, lovely lady saying, now I can sew my clothes in half the time. And you can see it was only $12, the small, small uh, sewing machine pictured here. Alfred Nobel, the dynamite guy. He actually invented dynamite, which is kind of ironic because he's also going to be the creator of the Nobel Prize. Alexander Graham Bell, as you saw, the telephone. Uh, he had relatives who had hearing problems and got interested in transmitting sound. So he is going to revolutionize our world and uh, invent this is the original telephone. Don't ask me how it works. I do not know. But this was a demonstration because people thought it was like a trick, that, that it's not possible. So they would put relatives in different towns and have them talk to one another and have huge audiences that were just entranced by this. Thomas Edison, known as the Wizard of Menlo Park. We're going to have a little uh, and puzzle about Thomas Edison, and he is a prolific inventor. Menlo Park was in New Jersey, and he made it possible for other inventors to uh, to invent things. Basically, phonograph, of course, is one of his.
Ever since people learned to harness electricity, it has been a necessary resource in our daily lives. But before electricity, life was very different. Most work and leisure took place during daylight hours. Even in big cities like New York, work stopped when the sun went down. When electricity became widely available, it changed everything. And the person responsible for this change was Thomas Alva Edison. He is credited with ushering in the age of electricity, among other things. To this day, Edison's name is associated with invention and innovation. Edison was born in 1847 in Milan, Ohio. As a child, he was an enthusiastic student of science, often conducting experiments at home. Sometimes his experiments didn't have the best outcomes. Once, when he was experimenting with fire, Edison accidentally burned down his family's barn. In another experiment, he convinced a friend to consume large amounts of Seidlitz powder, which creates gas in the stomach. He told the boy he would be able to fly. The boy did not fly. And the experiment only resulted in severe stomach pains for his friend and a stern lecture for Edison. But Edison's scientific curiosity never faded. In 1859, he persuaded his parents to let him take a job with the Grand Trunk Railroad as a candy and newspaper vendor. He soon set up a chemistry lab and printing press in a train car. He was only 12 years old. Edison's chemistry lab soon came to an end when a bottle of phosphorus fell and ignited a fire. The train conductor struck Edison's ear, and some experts believe this may have caused the deafness he experienced throughout his life. Edison's love of experimentation and sense of adventure eventually paid off. When he was 21, he perfected his first invention. It was an electric vote counter intended to be used in elections. A year later, in 1869, Edison invented the universal stock ticker. His employer paid him $40,000 for the machine, a huge sum of money. Soon after, Edison became a full-time inventor and set up a lab in Newark, New Jersey. A flood of inventions quickly followed. Among them, the electric pen and the first phonograph. Edison also made many improvements on technologies that already existed. He came to be known as the Wizard of Menlo Park, where his lab was located in New Jersey. But Edison had even bigger plans in mind. He wanted to bring electricity to New York City. He mapped out a small area in downtown Manhattan to be the first district wired for electricity. There was only one problem. He hadn't invented the light bulb yet. But this problem was soon solved. On New Year's Eve, 1879, Edison held a demonstration of his creation at the Menlo Park Lab. On a stormy winter night, 3,000 onlookers watched in amazement as the factory and street nearby became aglow with light. After the stunned crowds finally left, Edison and his crew celebrated. Edison had to invent not only the light bulb, but also a system to generate and deliver electricity. So work soon began on a central power station. On September 4, 1882, the Pearl Street Power Station opened. It was the nation's first commercial power station. Within a few months, the station was lighting more than 3,000 lamps for more than 200 customers. A year later, the figures climbed to more than 10,000 lamps and about 400 customers. The Wizard of Menlo Park had done it. He had taken electric light out of the laboratory and made it available to businesses and individual customers. This innovation transformed New York City and the world. Before Edison's light bulb, most people lit their homes and offices with gas-burning lamps. These lamps provided only a soft, flickering glow and could be dangerous because the gas was flammable and poisonous. The only type of electric lighting available before 1879 was the arc light. They lit some city streets, but were far too powerful for homes and businesses. 
the incandescent bulb provided a light source that was safe, efficient, and long-lasting. Over the years, Edison's innovation would influence major changes in business, industry, and transportation. People gained control over light in homes and offices. Instead of rising with the sun and ending the day when it set, people could set their own hours. This meant more flexibility with home and office activities and greater productivity in the workplace because employees could work longer hours. Supplying electricity to homes and offices meant a network of wires, switches, and outlets that made it fairly easy to add appliances and other machines. This would have a huge effect on the manufacturing industry. Manufacturing exploded with the increased demand for home and office appliances, and the use of electrical machines in factories allowed for faster, more efficient production flow. Mass transit systems also started to use electric power. Electric streetcars and subways changed the nature of the workday in New York and other cities, allowing people to get to and from jobs much more quickly. Edison went on to invent other devices, including the kinetoscope, the first movie viewer. But none of his inventions changed people's lives as much as his incandescent light bulb and the creation of a central power station. Thomas Edison died in 1931 with 1,093 inventions to his name. His legacy remains with us to this day and still shapes our lives. And this is the first electric light bulb. Edison's movie camera, um, the whole Tesla AC-DC elect electricity controversy, and um, Henry Ford with the movable assembly line, which is going to revolutionize the automobile business. I'm this, this, wouldn't you love to have one of these cars today? This is the classic model. And then we have Orville and Wilbur Wright with the first motorized flight. And we will also be looking at a film of that. 